Welcome to Fire Safety, a brief overview of fire control primarily using fire extinguishers. In this program, we'll explore a couple of different avenues. We'll look at the different types of fire extinguishers available most commonly to most of us, as well as how to use them, how they're maintained for future, and how to give a brief once-over to make sure that they're properly placed and in good repair. So, thank you for joining me, and hopefully, uh, taken away from this course will be something uh, that one day you may never use, but if you do, you'll be able to fall back on the information learned here and potentially save a life or someone's property. An introduction to fire safety is, is a fairly broad scoped uh, adventure. And what I'm talking about is it's awfully difficult to start on this little journey we're going to go on without looking at the obvious. What's the obvious? The obvious is if you take care of yourself and your space around you, and I take care of myself and my space around me, and we're as safe as we possibly can be, the chances are our risk level will go down exponentially. However, it doesn't always work out that way. In this fast-paced society, we're coming and going uh, at phenomenal rates. Oftentimes, we're doing this without paying attention to some of the finer details that we used to. So, when it comes to fire safety, uh, the best way to introduce this particular subject is understand your surroundings. If there are things that are flammable or combustible that are within eye shot from you, know they're there. Know what type of flammability rating they've got. Uh, what types of fire extinguishers that they would possibly be using. And have a good working knowledge of where your working area is as opposed to where the fire suppression means are, where the fire extinguishers are, uh, potentially where a hose is uh, or water. Understanding that stuff, well, that just minimizes our risk. So we're going to be talking about uh, fire control and how to use a fire extinguisher and, and uh, how to make sure that they're placed properly and things of that nature. But understand that this is only a presentation done online. What should happen after today? Well, what should happen is this should be followed up with some practical applications, most likely in your shop. The worst scenario that somebody could be in is being on a job site, having some sort of fire breakout, and the first time they've ever seen or used a fire extinguisher was right there at a job site when somebody's life may be on the line or somebody's property may be on the line. There's a lot of intricacies to using a fire extinguisher that we just don't think about. For instance, when you look at the fire extinguisher here on the screen, the first thing that we think of here is we think, okay, well, I've seen that. A red fire extinguisher. We got the uh, the handle up here. We got the pin in place, uh, which allows us to to keep that handle from depressing um, by accident. So when we're going to use this, we pull that pin out and uh, we aim the hose here uh, at the the base of the fire. We sweep it side to side and we pull uh, we pull down on this as we're doing that, and that's. That's basically what makes the uh, the suppressant agent that's inside of the extinguisher come out. I get that. I've seen that on TV. I've heard people talk about it. But until you do it, that application is really seeming simple. Do it at a safety meeting, uh, at an internal meeting at the shop, uh, somewhere along the line. Make sure that you you get your hands on a fire extinguisher and you're able to practice. They do have a lot of pushback. So that may be one of those things that you're just not prepared to deal with. If the first time you pull that pin 
is when property damage is at stake and you have to make sure that you use that fire extinguisher uh, to the most efficient use as possible you, you may be surprised at how much kickback it has and if it freaks you out you might drop it or you might hold the handle down uh, longer than it needs to be held down or in a fashion that's not even on the fire because it startles you right at first you only get roughly a minute ish on most of these fire extinguishers uh, once that is uh, depressed uh, to hold that down for your fire suppression so it's not a lot of time now when it comes to portable fire extinguishers it's one of the most common fire protection appliances used today uh, in most cases, many cases, the portable fire extinguisher uh, can be used to put out a fire in a lot less time than other methods. Now, it's not to say that it is the only method out there. There are fire blankets and things of that nature, but uh, much more common uh, is your run-of-the-mill fire extinguisher. Uh, even though they're common, one of the things that... Uh, gets kind of lost in the shuffle is there are standards that are followed in order to make sure that uh, fire extinguishers are compliant. All of the fire extinguishers have to meet the criteria that you're going to find in NFPA 10, which is the standard for portable fire extinguishers. Uh, and then they've also um, got to have that underwriter's laboratory uh, rating in the United States. When it comes to fire extinguishers, there is more than just a one-size-fits-all attitude for them. Now, it is true, you can get a fire extinguisher that fits several different categories uh, of potential fires, uh, but you could also get individual rated fire extinguishers. They come in different sizes. Uh, they look a little bit different from time to time, and they're designed to fight different types of fires. Uh, for instance, the three we have listed here, A, B, and C, are a great example. A is going to be your ordinary combustibles. B is going to be your flammable liquid. C is going to be your electrical equipment. And in the coming minutes, we're going to talk a little bit more about those. And, uh, you know, one thing that is important to note, we don't just have a letter designation for these, do we? We also have a color, a picture, uh, and those are very key uh, indicators as to what type of fire extinguisher we got. And it's easy to see from a long ways away, even for folks uh, that have hindrances with reading or, or the alphabet. Uh, we can always see the shapes and the colors uh, that go along with that. So let's talk for a moment about the fire triangle. What in the world is a fire triangle? Well, when you look at it, fire is basically a chemical reaction. It really takes three conditions to happen perfectly to produce a fire. you got to have some sort of fuel, enough heat to raise its temperature to the point that it wants to ignite, and enough oxygen pres present to sustain that combustion. Now, with those three ingredients happening just so, well, you're going to get the fire triangle. Okay, and that fire triangle is, is used to refer to uh, the sustainability and um, the probability of any certain chemical uh, becoming flammable or combustible and what it takes to get there. Oftentimes you're going to see the fryer triangle with percentages and this and that. Uh, maybe even I've seen some that have the upper and lower explosive limit, um, you know, the amount of oxygen, uh, how, how much of the fuel to air, uh, air ratio it takes. It can get very complicated. I didn't want to stay in that complicated range. Uh, in my opinion, there's definitely a place for that. There's a science behind this stuff. But if we're here for just an hour, or two hours, or four hours, we're not going to come out of this with a degree. But we do need to come out of this with a better understanding of how fire works, what causes it, how do we get rid of it.
or control it. And in that uh, case, we're looking at it in very simplistic forms. The three basic conditions that we're looking at that need to happen is we've got to have fuel to burn. We've got to have heat that's going to raise that temperature to the point it wants to ignite, and we've got to have oxygen. That's about as simple as you could possibly make it, and we refer to this as the fire triangle. So throughout this or any other presentation, if somebody's talking about a fire triangle, then they're talking about those three uh, components happening. Now, there can be many different layers of that fire triangle, other things you can add in there. Uh, this is about as simple as I've stated as you're going to see. So let's look at a couple of the classifications of fires. Uh, first of all, we got a Class A fire. Class A are your routine run-of-the-mill uh, combustibles like paper, wood, clothing, uh, things of that nature. Things generally that you'd be able to put out with water. A Class A fire extinguisher is used on these ordinary combustibles and usually the Class A fire extinguishers are water-based. If you have a pump tank extinguisher, you got to make sure that you're checking that periodically. Uh, generally speaking, uh, periodically could be twice a year, could be once a year, but we need to make sure that not only do we have enough uh, water present, uh, but we need to make sure that it's functioning properly as well. And really you should call in a, a professional um, to do your inspection of the fire extinguishers at least once a year. And a side note, when we're talking about water-based units, anytime we're talking about water for that matter, there's a chance of freezing if you get too cold. So keep that in mind. Use common sense uh, when you're uh, placing a Class A fire extinguisher in a building. Don't put it in an area where it could possibly be subject to freezing. Class B fires are fires that involve flammable liquids. Could be flammable oils uh, or greases, gasoline, paint, things like that. Things that you would not put out with water, right? We've all heard the adage, if you put water on a grease fire, well, not only do you not put out the grease fire, you've made the fire uh, loads uh, bigger. So we want to make sure uh, that we're using a proper fire extinguisher on a Class B fire. And uh, when it comes to the fire extinguisher, there are a few that you can choose from. Probably the most common is going to be your, your CO2 fire extinguisher. Uh, but there are also dry chemicals and foam that can be used as well. And it's worth noting that all three of these types that could be used to put out a Class B fire could also be used to put out a Class A fire. Not always true going forward, say into Class C, but uh, we'll talk about that uh, when the time gets here. So what's the difference between a Class B fire extinguisher and a Class A fire extinguisher? Tick tock, tick tock, time's up. The CO2 style fire extinguisher is going to steal the air, right? It's going to displace that oxygen from the scenario so there's not enough oxygen to support that flame. And what happens? Stifles the flame, starves it of oxygen, it goes out. Uh, the Class A fire extinguisher, the water-based style, it steals the heat. Okay, so we, we're, we're achieving the same goal. We're putting the fire out, but there's two different ways of doing it. When it comes to the Class B fire extinguishers and you are using the dry chemical style, those work uh, about the same way as many of the other fire extinguishers out there as far as functionality, but they're simply taking away that chemical reaction uh, of the combustion. We've got a couple of different styles, right? One type contains sodium bicarbonate, potassium bicarbonate, potassium uh, chloride-based agents. Uh, also when it comes to foam fire extinguishers, they are a little bit different. Why are they a little bit different? Well, they caused me to backtrack just a little bit. Just a second ago, I said you cannot use water-style fire extinguishers to put out a Class B fire. 
meaning the pump style like you would use on classification of A fires. However, the AFF F fire extinguishers, which stands for aqueous film forming foam uh, fire extinguishers, which create a foam, they are water based. And that water based foam spreads, covers the fire area, and stifles the oxygen. So again, we're stealing the oxygen. It's just a little bit different way to do it. But because they are water based, this makes it so that they cannot be used for class C fires. And speaking of class C fires, let's talk about those. Uh, class C fires are a lively bunch, literally. When it comes to class C fires, they're, they're uh, uh, electrical fires. And anytime that you've got an electrical fire, it's always assumed that the fire is uh, on live electrical equipment, thus the uh, dry joke about being a live bunch, right? Um, so, Class C electrical fires can happen in any number of ways. There are several different instances that come to mind for you right now. For instance, let's say we've got too many things plugged into a circuit. Too many things plugged into a circuit can overload the circuit. An overloaded circuit draws more amperage, creates more heat, can melt the sheathing on the wire, and most of the sheathing for the wires are flammable, so they themselves uh, can begin to burn. But think about it on the refrigeration side of things. Oftentimes in a refrigeration room or in a refrigeration skid or inside of a uh, compartment or casing of a refrigeration appliance, there's a little bit of oil. Let's say we overamp, we've got a small spark, a small spark on that oil, especially if it's misty oil, it can ignite it, burn the sheathing off the wire. Now we've got live wires that are uncovered and we've got a fire. So there are those situations that you get fires that are electrically related that you could very easily be live. And because of that, because that's the most present danger, it's always assumed that an electrical fire is on live equipment. What does that mean? Well, that means if you're putting out a fire on electrical equipment, you better make sure whatever you're using doesn't bridge the gap between the panel and yourself. What's worse than an electrical fire? An electrical and electrical fire that's a live electrical fire in which somehow something between you and it is electrically conductive and bridges that gap. Now you're part of that electrical pathway. So always use something that's electrically non-conductive uh, for your uh, fire control. So let's look at a couple of those. Uh, first of all, a few of the ones from the class B selection that we talked about are okay to use also in class C. Uh, CO2 extinguishers and dry chemical extinguishers uh, are very effective when fighting an electrical fire. However, as I previously pointed out, you cannot, should not, do not use foam extinguishers on an electrical fire. Those are water-based. Water-based means that it's going to be electrically conductive and it will create an intensely uh, dangerous situation for you or anybody that's using it. Class A and B extinguishers may be used if electrical equipment is not energized. However, best policy, best practices as a company, as an individual, or as a owner of an establishment having somebody out doing work, always assume it's live. That way you're always taking the best safety precautions available to you at the time. Class D. Class D is combustible metals. Now, how would metal just combust? Well, we're not talking quarter inch thick steel under most circumstances. We are talking uh, industrial plants, manufacturing facilities in which 
metal has now become powdered or created a dust in the air and the dust is so much dust that there's enough there to ignite and there's enough oxygen present to support that flame. Now one of the things that's a little bit different about class D fires than other, other style of fires, they're hotter and they take special uh, control measures to get them under control. Generally speaking, Class D fire extinguishers are going to be dry powder extinguishers. And when it comes to the dry powder extinguishers used specifically for Class D fires, oftentimes uh, local fire stations do not have the means to put out uh, a Class D fire along with them on their fire trucks. So they're going to rely on whatever's at the facility to put that out. So make uh, real sure that you've got the proper uh, control measures there at the facility. If you're not going to be the one that's going to use them, make sure they're there for the fire department uh, when they get there. Very dangerous to try to control these yourself. Additionally, on fire extinguishers, when you've got a fire extinguisher and you've got the ABC rating on there or D okay? or maybe you have all of them maybe you've gone down to your local home store and you've got a universal one which consequently oftentimes are less expensive because they're more common you know as well as I do the less common something is like a B only or an A only the more expensive it will be eh, I always relate that back to a 24-hour gas station having locks on the doors I once asked why do you have locks on a 24-hour open gas station? And the manager simply replied, because it was more expensive to get the doors without the locks, because it's uncommon. Hmm, smart. In addition to the ABC rating, in addition to the color coding, in addition to the picture of the triangle, the square, the circle, the star, we also have numbers. What do the numbers mean? Well, depending on which side of the table you sit on, it could indicate the size of the fire that you can use that fire extinguisher on, or it could indicate how long that you're going to be able to depress the handle. Uh, either way, guess what? You're right. Uh, give you an example. An extinguisher classified as 4A can be expected to extinguish a Class A fire twice as large as that of a unit classified as a 2A. So you're going to have a number designation and a picture and a letter most often on fire extinguishers. And this is there for our safety so that everybody around us, uh, no matter the person, is able to decipher what they've got there for their fire control. Uh, make sure that periodic inspection uh, is taken place with these fire extinguishers as well. In most municipalities, that's mandatory at least once a year, where you've got the fire marshal um, or your fire inspector coming through, uh, tapping on your extinguishers, making sure they're um, up to scuff on their charge, uh, that they're not in any kind of disrepair or, or damaged uh, at all in any way. Uh, and it's a very simple, very quick process. And oftentimes, like I said, your local fire department, fire inspector, uh, or your fire marshal would usually be happy to come through and make sure that your stuff is in good shape. Proper fire extinguisher use. You should only attempt to use a fire extinguisher if each of these things are checked off. Now granted, Everything happens in a split second. So just use common sense and most of these things will be taken care of. But for the purpose of this presentation, we're going to go through them one by one. Make sure the building is being evacuated. Don't grab a fire extinguisher and not let anybody know there's an issue. If there's an issue that requires you to get a fire extinguisher, somebody else needs to know. There may be follow-up required. You could put out the fire now and in a short while it could rekindle itself as it's smolder, smoldering uh, underneath the surface. Make sure the fire department's been called. Professionals should be called. They should be on the way, even though you may not need them, uh, 
uh, even though it might be small, they've got to come out and look at it. It's the right thing to do. Properties at stake, human lives could be at stake. You should only apply them uh, or, or use the fire extinguisher in applications where the fire is small or even contained. And the exit's clear. Oftentimes, when a person's using a fire extinguisher, they're using a fire extinguisher for their means of exit. Is this right, wrong, and different? Well, think about it. If you're sitting in a class full of people and the fire alarm goes off and there's a stairway or a hallway before your exit, one of the smart things to do is, obviously, eyes and ears, make sure that you're looking around, see if you can see the fire. Uh, if there's a door you've got to go through, get close to the door, see if you can feel any heat on that. If there's no heat, have a fire extinguisher with the lead guy going out, open that door, allow the lead guy to go with the fire extinguisher so that he can be prepared to cool off any pathways uh, for everybody to get out safely. The lead guy is going to get your way uh, through that hallway, through that doorway, to the outside with that fire extinguisher as a means of escape. Uh, so as a safety uh, device, if you, if you would. Stay low, avoid any smoke. We've often heard it's not necessarily the flames that do the damage. Uh, it's the smoke that's in the air that's inhaled, and even though you get out, it could do long-term damage. So it may not be far to go, but if there's smoke present, don't chance it. Get down low below that smoke and crawl your way out. Make sure that there's a proper fire extinguisher available. Some areas may have a fire extinguisher. They might have a fire blanket available. Make sure whatever you're using is proper for the job. You would certainly not want to put fire uh, out in an electrical panel with a Class A fire extinguisher. You just wouldn't want to do it. Or something that had the aqueous foam in there. Uh, you don't want to have a casualty with the person trying to put out the fire because he bridged the gap in the electrical system. Use the buddy system. The buddy system is great in any dangerous situation. Whether you're watching a scary movie uh, and there's two police officers on the hunt for the bad guy, there's usually two of them. Uh, when you're fighting a fire uh, or trying to get out of the building or you're trying to contain a fire until the fire department gets there, use the buddy system. You're going to be concentrating on that fire. If you're not, your chances of doing any good with the fire extinguisher uh, are extremely diminished. Have somebody else there keeping out a look or keeping a lookout for you so that if that fire creeps up, they're going to see it. They're going to warn you and you can feel comfortable that they'll do that. That way your concentration will be on the fire. When it comes to the proper fire extinguisher use, once you've decided to use it, use it. Don't mess around. Always remember, uh, pass with the fire extinguisher, and it's going to help you um, use it. What does pass stand for? Pull the pin, aim the extinguisher, squeeze the trigger handle, and sweep it side to side. Now, where are you going to aim that extinguisher at? Well, when you think about it, go to the source. If you're cutting down a tree, you don't start high up in the limbs. Well, maybe for the stragglers you do. That way you're not taking down other stuff. Maybe not the best example, but you get my point. You want to start down low. You want to take that whole thing down. And then you're going to cut it up once you get down on the ground. Same thing with a fire. You're not going to start up in the flickering part of the flame that's way up at the top. You're going to start down at the base and you're going to try to stifle that flame clear down at the base. Sweep it side to side. Uh, and it'll be much more effective uh, than just aimlessly shooting it at a fire. Make sure uh, that you're decisive in what you're doing. You only get about a minute uh, in using a fire extinguisher that you can depress that handle before you run out of gusto in that fire extinguisher. So obviously, the bigger the number on the fire extinguisher, the longer you're going to be able to depress that handle. Uh, however, in any case, it's got to be quick. Make sure um, 
that you've got proper instruction uh, for your particular location from your fire department. Oftentimes, they're glad to come out once a year to train your guys, or even more often than that. When it comes to uh, finding out what the actual standards are, uh, NFPA 10 is where you're going to find them for the fire extinguishers. What are you going to find in there? Well, pretty much all of the minimum requirements for all types and sizes of extinguishers, as well as locations. And what you're looking at there is, you know, what's the type of hazard? You know, what what type of flammability or combustibility do we have in this location? Is there only one? Could there be more than one? Is it possible that we need to get a universal extinguisher that has the ABC rating on it? Do we need to have that D fire extinguisher even though it's only uh, for one location? What degree is the hazard? You know, is there a high likelihood that we're going to have an issue? Are you brazing in there? Are there sparks and arcs and uh, and oil and, and, and things like that, fumes present? What kind of danger are we actually talking about? And how, uh, you know, how dangerous is it? How is it there all the time because of normal business, normal practices? Or is it usually contained and it only happens uh, in that one-off situation where there's a crack or a leak or... Or, or drainage or something like that. How big of an area do we need to protect? Well, how big of an area do we need to protect goes a long ways because it doesn't tell you that you're going to have a huge fire tank, a fire truck tank size fire extinguisher if you've got a big, large open building uh, or a convention center or a hall or something like that. What it's telling you is how many fire extinguishers do I need? What's the spacing going to be? Uh, so those three right there go a long ways. Uh, what type of hazard do we have? How serious is the hazard? Is it there all the time or is it there just by accident or sometimes? What type of area size-wise are we talking about protecting? Uh, and we've got to have these things in the normal path of travel. You can't have them put in a closet where nobody's going to see it or behind items or under things. They've got to be out in the plain, uh, wide open space. Now. Two ways to look at that. Some people will look and say, oh my goodness, it just looks so ugly and tacky. I've heard that. Well, other people will look at it as, wow, they really take safety seriously. Uh, I feel good to be in this establishment because of that. Don't obstruct these things from view. If they're out of view, it's just as good as not having them at all. When it comes to placement of these, they shouldn't be mounted higher from the floor to the top of the extinguisher than five foot if they're 40 pounds or less, or three and a half foot if they're heavier than 40 pounds. So there are actually height requirements as well. In addition to your placement as far as how high off the floor, you're also going to have a distance requirement in placing your fire extinguisher. And we're not talking about, you know, just catty corner and everything. We're talking, as the way it's worded, the maximum travel distance between fire extinguishers does not exceed blank. Okay, so travel distance what we're talking about. And, of course, it's got to be out in the open, as we talked about. 75 feet for a Class A style fire extinguisher, so you'd be in a Class A style uh, fire hazard. Or 50 foot for a Class C style fire uh, hazard in, in fire area. So now we're talking electrical fires. They should be checked regularly. Make sure that they're in their designated locations, uh, especially if things have changed. Make sure they haven't been tampered with or used. You know, some uh, the silly guy comes along and just messes around with it, and, and now it's not uh, not going to be there for you in, in proper working order when you actually have a fire. And make sure that they don't have any kind of corrosion or damage or, or any other impairments uh, to the outside casing or, or to their functional uh, properties. I, when it comes to inspections uh, and maintenance, they should be examined at least once a year by 
a bona fide fire extinguisher company, um, or it could be by your fire marshal or your uh, fire inspector. This type of pro uh, preventative maintenance program uh, is about the best thing that you can come across uh, as far as keeping your equipment reliable and in and, and its good working order as it's supposed to be. I mean, when you look at the whole idea behind this stuff, it's to make sure it's there when you need it. And that's your formal style of, of, of checks that you should do on your fire extinguishers. Now, informally, make sure every time you're on a work site, you know where the fire extinguisher is. If there isn't one out there, oftentimes people aren't going to go tell the, the general, hey, I need to have a fire extinguisher over here, uh, you know, because they don't want to seem out of place or uh, too abrupt. Get your own. Bring one from your van. Bring one from the shop. If you need to have one buy in, one's not available. The idea is to make sure that your work area is safe. Check the inspection date on the existing ones that are there on the work site, and then also glance at that stuff at your own shop, in your van, at your house. The best pr protection by far is going to be making sure that your area is secure and protected and and all potential combustibles and flammables have been protected or isolated uh, from a situation that's going to cause them to flame up before you're starting your service or work in a building make sure um, that the alarm system in any building whether it's a constructive building uh, for commercial or industrial or a home, make sure that there's a fire suppression system is working. Now we've talked an awful lot about flammable and combustible liquids and gases and things like that. So it's worth taking just a second here uh, to isolate those couple of items and describe the difference between them. First of all, uh, if we're talking flammable, that means it can ignite below 100 degrees. Something like gasoline or paint thinner. If we're talking about combustibles, combustibles have to get above 100 degrees uh, in order to ignite. There we're probably going to be talking about fuel oil uh, or kerosene or something like that, just as examples. There might be other serious uh, threats or health uh, risks that are associated with those uh, aside from the flammability and combustibility uh, if you go to inhaling these or getting them on your skin what's going to happen uh, you should really check the MSDS sheet how, I, how, how do you get exposed to this certain product or, or chemical uh, do you breathe it in uh, do, you, do you have to ingest it uh, it does just have to touch your skin and then once you've been exposed to it uh, how do you know does it cause an, a rash? Are you gonna Are you gonna have a, a cough, a, a nuisance cough? Are you gonna have a a, a twitch or or something uh, involuntary happen? And then once you figure that out, how do you get rid of the problem? How, how do you mitigate the issue? Uh, can you just wash it off? Does it require medical treatment? Does it require medicine for extended periods of time? And then after you've mitigated the issue. Uh, for the immediate time, are there any long-term side effects? All of those questions can be answered on the MSDS sheet. The fire hazards most frequently associated with refrigeration and air conditioning work uh, usually are going to be classified in any of the three areas. Could be Class A, Class B, or Class C. Uh, class D may be a little bit of a one-off. Uh, but the other three uh, generally could be associated with our refrigeration systems or HVACR systems. When you think about it, we're dealing with refrigerants and under the right circumstances, if you're vaporizing a refrigerant uh, or putting it under pressure, refrigerants certainly uh, can be flammable. Uh, and we're also dealing with solvents. You think about flushing agents that go through the system to flush out the line sets and such. Uh, fuels we're dealing with. Um, furnaces, 
uh, and then of course construction materials all around uh, and then just the products that are being refrigerated themselves uh, maybe we're doing comfort cooling and we've got a, a cube farm where there's all kinds of flammable items or maybe we're just cooling stuff and we've got a warehouse full of cardboard boxes and, and, and things of that nature. Let's look at a few of these. If we're looking at oils, oils normally don't present a fire hazard. However, if the oil is spilling or leaking out or in some way, shape or form uh, is being misted, uh, for instance, if you've got a puncture in an oil filter and because you've got that puncture you've got high pressure and the oil is uh, spitting out of the side of that filter uh, into the air it's going to have enough present to ignite most likely so make sure that there's no oil present during your work and uh, certainly make sure that if there is be very careful and deactivate any lighting source or any ignition source and clean up the problem. Next comes solvents. Most solvents can be handled relatively safely at normal room temperatures, but once you elevate that temperature up around or above 100 degrees Fahrenheit, that's where things start to go sideways. Make sure you keep the room well ventilated. Don't be smoking and make sure that you keep a handle on the materials that you're using. When it comes to fuels, there's a lot of them out there that we use on a regular basis, whether it be in our vehicles uh, or be in our tools to do our normal work, uh, yet we also, under the same token, don't necessarily take the best practices approach to using these items all the time. Now we're talking about natural gas, LP, uh, fuel oil uh, as well, and then oftentimes kerosene, depending on your area of the country, uh, could be used as well. All of these are highly flammable, and if you confine them, it increases the pressure. What happens when you increase pressure? You increase temperature. You will reach their flash point under a relatively small amount of pressure. You reach the flash point and a boom happens. Make sure you're handling these with care. And I would certainly hope that I don't have to say this, but again, don't be smoking or using arcs and sparks around fuel. Now, general housekeeping, uh, we've had good housekeeping principles for a long period of time, but it's worth talking about. It's worth talking about even at your safety meeting, uh, not just for the flammability and combustibility reasons, but also people could slip and trip if you're not keeping debris and, and uh, hazards out of the way in your normal high traffic areas, right? Uh, so we're not just talking about uh, flames here or combustibility. We're talking about also just practicality. Make sure that all combustibles and flammable uh, uh, items are stored properly. If you've got combustible waste materials, make sure they're stored in a covered metal receptacle. Any refrigeration and air conditioning systems got to be kept clean. If you've got oil covering and coating the inside of those cabinets or wires, you're creating a ripe situation where these things could flame up. Uh, when it comes to cleaning our, our, our office spaces or our warehouses or work sites, uh, sweeping compounds that we use are oftentimes combustible. So when you're putting down sweeping compound, make sure you get it all back up off the floor. And again, make sure that you're not smoking while you're doing it. Uh, it creates a hazard for everybody involved, especially when we're talking sweeping compounds because it's scattered over a large area, usually of a large building. Uh, when it comes to floor covering, uh, cover, coverings and cleaning solutions, um, if they say they've got a low flash point uh, material, they can still be dangerous. Uh, the low flash point materials, um, like oily mops and rags, should be stored in metal containers still. Make sure 
that fire extinguishers are around, they're properly maintained, and they're regularly inspected. And after they're used, get them refilled as soon as possible. Precautions we really need to go over very quickly just to sum some of this stuff up uh, before we get to the closing here are really, really common fire causes. We've got electrical malfunctions. Electrical malfunctions don't necessarily have to be caused by you. If you're out there working on a, on a condenser uh, or any kind of refrigeration skid or ventilation system, Electrical malfunctions can occur because of overloading, uh, aged products, sparks and arcs, uh, improperly used uh, parts. We've got friction. Anytime you're in a manufacturing plant or commercial building, you could have belts running. Uh, belts or, or textiles or fabrics, they can cause friction, which causes heat. Heat leads to flammability and combustion. Open flames, always an issue. Uh, not, uh, not to be undersold here, open flames are lighters, cigarettes, candles. Candles are highly common in workplaces uh, nowadays. Sparks, sparks could be caused from any number of items, whether it's a simple light switch or somebody unplugging an appliance. Possibly it's appliances turning on and off uh, routinely because of remote controls. Uh, sparks happen, they're always a common source of ignition. Plain old hot surfaces. One of the things we didn't have to think of when we're looking at hot surface is the old uh, the old style hot plates now have been turned into new style lower heat, mind you, candle heaters. Cigarette smoking uh, obviously can be a, a very large source of, of ignition for fires. Reduce the risks by making sure that every technician has a fire extinguisher in the vehicle. In fact, I'd go out on a limb here and say if you get pulled over by commercial vehicle enforcement or, or DOT, they're going to probably want to see that you have a fire extinguisher on board and the type of fire extinguisher is going to be determined by what you're carrying in that vehicle. Every shop's got to have at least one fire extinguisher always available. Remember the placement and the height based on NFPA 10 principles. Direct that stream to the base of the flame and not on the flame itself. Never throw water on an oil-based fire. Should go without saying. Now ask yourself, why would I not want to throw water on an oil-based fire? Fairly simple oil and water don't mix. It's going to spread that fire. Don't leave oily rags or mops around. If you throw out a cigarette or a match, don't let them go out all by themselves. Take that little exerted effort to put them out. Change your work clothes as soon as you get home if possible, especially if they're oily. Don't smoke in bed. Keep your uh, truck and for that matter, your work area and your shop, free from junk. Don't let stuff pile up. Keep things in an orderly manner. Make sure you know where your fire extinguisher is. It'll be easier to get to it. And it'll be easier to spot your fire hazards as well. Make sure that anytime you're handling any kind of gases, that you're handling it with care. You don't want to spill this stuff over or leave it all confined. Make sure that you're just well aware of all of the possible situations anytime that you're on the job or at home for that matter. Only takes a fraction of a second to ignite a flammable gas. Don't discharge any flammable gas in any unventilated room or space. It doesn't make sense to do so. It'll accumulate. Some of the things that often uh, happen on the job site, especially on the install side of things. We're down there gluing uh, our condensate drains or potentially venting out a furnace or a water heater. And we've used glue for a long period of time and maybe even left the cap off for a while. That glue accumulates and you now have a highly flammable uh, situation there 
in the basement. So you want to make sure that some time passes where you can get some ventilation down there to clear those items. To sum this stuff up, we've got some uh, tips that we're going to go over here at the very end, and they're very simple. They're common sense, but again, they're worth bringing up. That's what safety meetings are for, to bring things that we do every day so routinely over and over and over to the forefront of our mind so that we're thinking about it again. Remove trash and, and uh, items from your work area at least once a day. Get rid of any oily, greasy, or painted rags uh, or towels, and make sure and put them into metal-covered containers. Keep any kind of solvents or flammable combustible materials in labeled containers so that other people other than yourself know that there are some things in those containers uh, that could potentially ignite. Keep any kind of sparks or, or arcs uh, or excessive heat away from any of the solvents or, or ignitable materials. And don't use any of these flammable liquids or gases for anything other than what they're intended to be used for. You're just asking for trouble uh, in that sense. Keep in all the fire exits and passageways clear. Make sure that firefighting equipment uh, or things you're going to use to control that flame are always in good repair and always ready to be used. After all, we never know when something's going to happen. Practice fire drills to make sure that everybody's prepared. It seems like uh, a childish thing to do or a monotonous thing to do, but it saves lives. Uh, for any more information, you can go to the State Department of Labor and Industry, or you can refer uh, over to the National Fire Protection Association. You can go to nfpa.org. Uh, the fire protection, the NFPA section that you would be referring to for fire extinguishers would be NFPA 10. For more information pertaining to any of the subjects that we've just covered, or for bulk quantities of educational materials for either the general public or your internal employees, please contact your local fire department or chapter of the NFPA. Electrical safety. That's what we're going to be talking about for roughly the next hour or so, and we're going to try to cover all types of different aspects of electrical safety that you find in the trades industry. Why do we talk about electrical safety? Well, when you think about it, it's very, very difficult to do any tradesman job without having electricity involved. But just think about that. How would we deal with power vented water heaters if we couldn't work with electricity? How many of you HVACR technicians are out there that in order to mechanically diagnose your projects or your appliances, you have to understand some electricity. Electricians spend their careers learning more and more about how to keep themselves safe, what, uh, what particular situations present dangers, and what, what type of dangers they present. However, the rest of us in the trade industry only learn enough to get by oftentimes, which is where we get into trouble. We always feel safe, and if most of you uh, are similar to myself, there's really nothing we can't handle, in our own minds that is. In reality, there's a lot of things we work on that we probably just shouldn't, and we don't think twice about the repercussions uh, for our lack of understanding of those subjects, but we really, really should. So that's why we're going to cover this particular uh, subject. When it comes to electric current, electric current, regardless of how small the current is, or whether they're encountered in the workplace or even at home, they could be sufficient to cause serious harm like burns, both internal and external, blindness, or any variety of injuries uh, related to falls even. Obviously the, uh, the worst case scenario is death by electrocution, which by the way is something important to point out. When it comes to a 
true electrician, a, 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 a person that's that's electrically licensed and so on, so forth. The word electrocution and shock mean two different things. Now, in the other trades industry, we throw those around like they're no big deal. Uh, however, in the electrical industry, the difference between elect electrocution and shock is one you walk away and one you simply don't. <laughs> now, you may be working with coloring books for a little while, uh, but you made it through if you've been shocked. Electrocution, well, electrocution's the end of the ball game uh, for, for that individual. So workers in the HVACR industry, uh, you know, generally make our, our living working around electricity. We have uh, uh, our exposure time elevated anytime we're on installation, almost every time we're on any kind of maintenance or repair, and we work on high and low voltage systems. So constantly being exposed to those types of environments require us to have an extensive knowledge even beyond uh, the mechanical industry. It's important to understand and recognize the electrical hazards and the methods of preventing electrical shocks and, and other related injuries. Uh, and of course, we want to be able to prevent electrocution. On average, one worker in North America is electrocuted every day, making electrician, uh, electrocution one of the leading causes of death in the workplace, especially among young workers. Over half of all the electricians and electrical injuries are suffered by workers who are working on systems with voltages less than 600 volts. So our idea of electrocution only happens at high amounts of voltage is not true. Oftentimes it's at lower voltage, lower than 600 volts. When it comes to electrical safety, the one thing you gotta keep in mind uh, and it's one thing uh, that's basically followed throughout the National Electric Code. Make sure that you don't electrocute the individuals and make sure that you don't burn the building down. Well, today we're going to talk a little bit about both of those subjects. But the first thing we're going to talk about is protecting yourself or others around you. Obviously, the body can become a path for the current when it becomes part of that electrical path, uh, it doesn't just go through the body, it goes through all the paths. So even though I become part of that electrical circuit, I'm by far not going to be the path of least resistance, which a lot of people make the mistake of thinking. In fact, the human body uh, has resistance of anywhere from 100 ohms to a million ohms, depending on uh, the size of the individual, the humidity, water content, the makeup, all of those things can uh, go into effect when you're calculating what the resistance of the human body is. If you're curious, just grab a meter, uh, especially if you've got an analog meter, they're great for the sensitivity that's required for this project. Put it on resistance and just simply hold on to each of the leads, the positive and negative. See what it gets from fingertip to fingertip, one hand, to the other hand. It's pretty interesting. Try it several times throughout the day or maybe several different days throughout the week and you'll see that your resistance will change uh, based on uh, you know varying conditions. Remember the lower the resistance in the body, wet hands, feet, uh, cuts, scrapes, etc. the higher the current flow through the body. When it comes to electric burns they're caused by current breaking through the skin and it's not always going to be vis visible. Now think about this for a second if you would. We've all heard about electric shocks and we've all seen pictures of what a sine wave looks like and uh, you know we know that once we get to uh, three phase voltage you, it's virtually impossible to let go. Well it's virtually impossible to let go because there's no peaks and valleys. Uh, there's three different sine waves all in one, and when one is starting to go down, the other one's starting to come up, and, and there's no uh, time within that pulsating uh, range that you're going to be able to let go. So, in looking at it that way, and you look at normal AC 120 volts, it's possible to take a shock and live through it. Uh, it. It may not be possible for everybody. Obviously, people die at that voltage every day. 
but when you look at it from that point of view and you go down lower in voltage even to our 24 volt thermostat the voltage isn't the key it's the amperage that goes through it and we'll look at a chart here in a little bit to see how uh, that amperage uh, affects the human body but picture with me if you will uh, a small amount of voltage a, a low voltage wire in your hand if you've got a low voltage wire in your hand first of all uh, even us biggest guys are gonna cry like a little baby uh, you know when we first get shocked we think it's the biggest thing in the world and then sometimes we feel f uh, foolish maybe you don't cry maybe you jump maybe the cry was a little bit harsh um, but if you're just sitting there in a chair like I am and you're holding a fist eventually inside of your palm you're gonna to start to sweat you can't help it it's just the way it the way it happens the body conducts heat and, and uh, uh, to get rid of that heat we're gonna to try to just sweat it off so imagine a wire being in there and that wire pulsating to the point where you can't let go of it it's just enough to where it can't let go it's painful uh, but it hasn't killed you then you start to sweat the sweat puts that moisture all over inside of your palm and while it's all over inside of your palm, that amperage is now being amplified to all different sections of your skin in your palm. Eventually, that amplification is going to burn through the skin. Once it burns through the skin, what's in the, what's in the middle of your, your hand? All kinds of little capillaries and, and arteries and veins and things like that. They're going to be a great conduit straight to your heart. So it's not just the the voltage that's going to get you. It's not just the amperage that's going to get you. It's the method in which you uh, you get shocked. All of these things line up in a certain fashion, and it can happen even at low amounts of voltage. Uh, some of the damages that can be caused could be uh, blood clots. And that's fairly common. It cooks your blood. I mean, you think about it. Um, electricity when you look down inside of a uh, uh, electric strip a uh, 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 air handler with electric strips you got just a bare wire it's all coiled up and because it's all coiled up there's work being done it glows red hot a lot of heats put off well when you think about it the same things happening right there in your hand it's gonna cook your blood uh, it could cook your digits you know one of the worst feelings uh, in the world has got to be being able to see your hand or your fingers or your leg or whatever um, whatever scenario that that uh, you can imagine and knowing it's there but knowing it's not going to be there for very long because because you fried your digits you've, you've fried your your, your flesh uh, I can virtually vaporize muscle tissue and give internal uh, organ damage you can have permanent nerve or even brain damage Blindness is another one that's not uh, uncom uh, uncommon at all. And that blindness could be temporary, but it could also be permanent. So there's all kinds of things that go into electrical safety that you may not have thought about or even took serious. Uh, and then, of course, you add to that falls. Now think about that. You've been shocked by low voltage before. Maybe even stuck a 9 volt, nine volt battery on your tongue. And it made you jump right it's a silly little trick we play when we're kids or maybe a frat trick or something like that but think about that think about being up on a ladder and you take a little bit of a jolt uh, low voltage or otherwise and just for a second you forget you're on a ladder correct but guess what the ground's going to be right there to remind you you were just on the ladder and it's going to catch your fall but it isn't going to feel good fall related injuries are huge uh, especially when dealing with electricity. Electrocution is often associated with high voltage. And we briefly talked about this already. Uh, and when we're talking about electri uh, electrocution, it's important to note we're talking about somebody that didn't make it. Um, high voltage is not always what we're looking at here. The amount of current is really what the factor is. So when you look at it, uh, electrocution and injuries from, uh, from electric shock can, occur, can really occur at any voltage provided the uh, appropriate current is there and, and available. Most of the time you hear about the high voltage shocks um, and they do result in injury or death 
but that's because generally speaking the higher the voltage the higher the amperage as well not always the case but oftentimes the case so at first glance lower voltages might not be very dangerous but if the conditions are right it could be fatal for you so make sure you're always taking uh, precautions to protect yourself on the job site there's nothing worse than trying to hurry to get something done so that you can be to an appointment on time or your kids baseball game or, or a wife's open house or something like that uh, and an accident occurs because you're trying to rush there's nothing worse that uh, worth that here's some of the uh, uh, indicators of electric shock or not indicators of electrical th uh, shock but uh, things that could lead to electric shock sources exposed wiring well hopefully that's not one of the things that you're dealing with if you're dealing with exposed wiring you got all kinds of other issues you walk up on a job site and you've got exposed wires the first thing that that I would be thinking is oh my goodness if it's right here where I can see it how much more exposed wiring is in areas that I can't see frayed cords frayed cords on a job site are uh, critically evil and if you have an OSHA official that comes out there or a safety monitor that comes out there, oftentimes if you've got frayed cords, they're going to cut the end off and they may even cut them in half uh, so that you're forced to go out there and get another cord. They're dangerous and there's no amount of uh, danger that's going to uh, be worth putting up with to get the job done. Uncovered panels, again, uh, if you've got uncovered panels, hopefully we've got some kind of markings there that indicate that and there's an electrician there that's working on that, but uncovered panels uh, are always a danger. Not just a danger because you could stick your hand in there, uh, that's not what, uh, what we're oftentimes worried about. We're worried about what's in the air, what's in the space between you and that panel. Even if you're just walking by, if the conditions are right, you could you could literally create an arc from that panel to your body uh, if you're not protected. Missing wire markings uh, are all too common. We've all run into those on the job site where you go out there and you thought one of those three wires was the neutral or the ground wire. You hook it up, turns out it wasn't. You create a huge flash or um, you've tripped some expensive uh, effective ground fault path uh, type of device you've blown some fuses and you know that all comes back to missing wire markings which could have been prevented at the onset of the installation of this job so make sure if you're out there you know we can't control what other people do but you're the one that's listening to this presentation so you're the one that's actually taking the initiative to get involved and do things the right way and be safe on the job site so make sure when you're on the job site you're not doing uh, that same thing always label your wires so people know what goes where especially if, if color coding is an issue improperly uh, installed connectors is another uh, huge uh, thing that we see out on the job site from time to time uh, maybe you've got the wrong uh, temperature designation on the terminals that you're using it for the job uh, maybe you've got just the wrong uh, the wrong terminations on the end wrong connectors in general uh, or maybe they're double lugged all of those things have to be taken care of because they can relate to tragedy whether the building could burn down because of an additional amount of heat that's created because of those improperly installed connectors or somebody could get uh, you know dangerously hurt loose terminals is another one uh, always check your terminals when you're having an issue uh, with uh, heat building up in a line or uh, potentially uh, prematurely tripping breakers Loose terminals are, are kind of a fickle subject. When you think about it, if you go out there and you've got aluminum or copper uh, wire going up into a terminal, as soon as you apply power to that, there's heat inside of that wire. Both of those metals are going to expand and contract with varying amounts of heat. It is possible that as it expands, 
it either uh, crushes down the wire a little bit because it's snugged up already and there's no room for expansion so it crushes it a little bit uh, or it starts to work out that lug on the terminal well then once it cools down uh, for whatever reason you know now it's going to be a loose terminal and stripped insulation uh, is also one thing that happens that's easily prevented generally speaking when we've got uh, insulation on a wire that's stripped back too far uh, so that it's hanging out of the wire nut or the terminals uh, obviously can create a hazard for any individual and then also for for the building as well uh, we've got bare exposed wires which brings us full circle around to what we were just talking about uh, all of these things are easily preventable and that's why I bring them up uh, they're not something that will spend you all or will take you all day to go out to a job site and verify they're not there they're things that you could go out quickly um, fix if they're an issue but mainly as you're installing something for the first time or brand new after a retro you can make sure that all of these things are in check when you leave so that it's right from that point on and that's really what we're trying to do um, in this particular presentation as well electric shock the body can act as a conductor uh, and we've talked about this in order to receive electric shock your body's got to act as some sort of a conductor it gives a path a complete path or maybe even a circuit that current can travel through it's normally accomplished when you touch a bare wire or a live, uh, you know, quote unquote hot wire uh, or a live component with one part of your body and another part of your body comes in contact with an electrical ground or uh, a wire component with a different voltage potential. And then you become part of the circuit. If your body becomes the path uh, in which the current can travel, doesn't mean it's the least resistance. Uh, what it does mean is it as a path so uh, it's important to make sure that you're taking all the safety measures uh, and putting those in place as you're working on this stuff don't become part of that circuit and it's all too fa uh, too common for guys to overlook that portion actual currents going to determine how much injury is actually sustained the amount of resistance the body has uh, can can vary all the time depending on the varying conditions the amount of moisture perspiration on your skin uh, moisture in the air if you're standing on concrete or a metal floor leaning up against a railing all of those types of things um, come into factor when you're talking about how much current is actually going to travel through your body and they'll change the resistance that it has to go uh, through the actual path of the current through the body and the length of time is going to determine how much injury is actually sustained uh, for example if current flows from your finger to your elbow on the same arm you might experience a lot of pain however the amount of current passing through your heart and your lungs can cause fibrillation what's fibrillation your heart basically works a bazillion miles an hour roughly 300 beats per minute not enough to get a full beat it's really just kind of a quiver uh, and it stops moving blood throughout your body it happens at a very 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 low amperage we'll talk about that here in just a second so it doesn't take a whole lot you go from your finger to your elbow on the same uh, on the same arm yeah it's gonna hurt uh, you go from your your leg to your knee or your leg to your hip yeah it's gonna hurt uh, but it's not going through your heart and your lungs so you might not sustain the, the same type of fatal injury uh, it may be long-term or permanent injury but but it may not be fatal uh, so it, it all depends on the scenario if things line up just right you're gonna be in trouble let's look at the effect on the body here uh, if you look starting up the top here we got one milliamp now what's a milliamp let's keep this in perspective a milliamp is one one thousandth of an amp okay it's not a millionth of an amp that's a micro uh, we're talking about milliamps here one milliamp can cause a slight tingle usually nothing's going to be visible on the skin 
uh, and normally you're not going to have any uh, bodily damage or permanent damage. But you're talking one million, one one thousandth of an amp, you're going to feel a tingle. You're going to know that it's there. That is just bizarre, don't you think? Two to nine milliamps, you can get a shock. Normally it's not painful, but think about it. Uh, some of these low voltage shocks that we get, they're not painful, but for the second, we don't realize it's low voltage and we are frightened uh, immediately. We jump, we shake our hands, we, we don't think about what we're doing, we don't have the time to do that. And secondary related injuries uh, really at this 2 to 24 uh, milliamps become a huge deal. And when I say become a huge deal, they obviously are going to happen beyond that. But the difference between actually doing bodily injury on a shock uh, versus doing bodily injury because you jerked your hand and hit it on all the metal objects inside of that, uh, uh, that cabinet are going to be way skewed towards a secondary injury, not towards the shock. Once you get beyond that 24 milliamps, then we start to see uh, shocks that, that actually create uh, damage possibly to the human body uh, or even death uh, because of the shock itself, not because of the secondary related injury. So it's kind of that happy spot right there uh, between that 24 and 25th milliamp. Uh, so moving on down, 10 to 24 milliamps, uh, very painful, could have some burns, could lose muscular control. 25 to 74 milliamps in this area we could actually get uh, severe contractions you could stop breathing you could die for sure and obviously you could have visible uh, visible burns uh, both where it goes into your body and comes out of your body at 75 to 300 milliamps uh, depending on the person this is definitely a high danger zone this is where you're most likely to have ventricular fibrillation, so your heart stops pumping blood. Uh, the really scary thing there is, uh, you know, painful, absolutely, but you, you, you're you still enduring it for a little while. Uh, so it, it's very, uh, it, it, it's a very tough thing to talk about. But if you don't talk about it, if you don't understand that this could happen even at small amounts of amperage, look at this, 75 one hundredths or 75 one thousandths of an amp can make this happen. And that's real. Uh, so when you're out there in the job site and, and, and people say this or that uh, couldn't kill you, boy, I'll tell you what, uh, hopefully you know better. And go all the way down here to uh, the bottom here. Uh, over one amp, life-threatening burns, uh, paralysis of your heart, death is, is highly likely. One amp. At 15 amps, which is the lowest fuse or circuit breaker size, 15 amps. Uh, the effects of a 15 amp uh, exposure to that electrical current is, is going to depend on, on how long that has happened. Uh, you know, like everything else we've talked about beyond that 75 to 300, uh, death is almost imminent. You may make it, uh, but but most likely you will not. So this stuff is real. Uh, it's very, very important to understand um, the likelihood of, of imminent death in these scenarios. So again, when talking about electric shock, uh, the most severe, the, the, uh, the most potentially fatal uh, circuit for electric current is one that passes right through the heart. So when you think about it, uh, you know, fingertip to fingertip on your left hand to right hand goes straight through the heart. Uh, one hand to one foot, no matter the side, could go straight through your heart. So those types of, of injuries uh, most likely will be lifelong injuries. Uh, but they definitely, most certainly, could lead to death. The most common non-fatal injuries uh, that are produced by electric shocks are usually going to be um, burns. Burns, temporary, permanent uh, vision loss. You could have marks on your body, uh, you know, maybe almost like a welt 
uh, could be on your body. Most of these are going to require immediate uh, medical attention. Uh, Any time that current passes through your clothing, you may have ignition on your clothing. We have seen uh, some, some very um, uh, stomach-wrenching videos on YouTube. If you go to YouTube and you just uh, do a search for ARC Flash, A-R-C Flash, two words, you're going to see all your fill of things that could go wrong on the job site. In fact, there's many of them that are on there that are normal mechanical guys or maintenance men on a facility uh, that weren't properly protected with their uh, personal protective equipment or their arc flash hazard suits and uh, they paid the price. Uh, there are some pretty gruesome videos on there. Um, now I chose not to show them during this class uh, because I don't want to be the, I don't want the class to be surrounding that. Uh, I want to talk about it. I want you to learn about it, but I don't want to uh, you know scare the dickens out of you. And plus, if you're sitting there in your home, and you're going through this uh, this presentation. Your wife or kids may be around you, and I don't want that to be something that they see uh, that's pertaining to something that could happen to daddy when he goes to work, or mommy when she goes to work. So that's why I've chosen not to put those in this presentation, just in case you're wondering. Other forms of burns caused when uh, high amperage current travels through the air, like an arc. Arcs can exceed 35,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That is astronomical. These temperatures, the intense heat and light can cause damage to the skin and of course eyesight, uh, as well as virtually vaporizing uh, any of the flame retardant, cl uh, uh, flame retardant clothing um, and the metal that's involved. Uh, when you look at some of the arc flash videos, you can see that copper and steel and aluminum just vaporize and become molten and, and fragmented. Uh, they become like a bomb. Uh, only that bomb is at elevated temperatures. So not only is the force of this stuff exploding out uh, going to do damage, but the heat that travels along with it. Uh, it, it's like a warm knife cutting through butter. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty nauseating to think about that. Um, electrical uh, components might explode, you know, and, and we've, we've talked about that already. It doesn't take a whole lot. Um, that molten me uh, metal goes in all different directions. And, uh, you know, one of the other things that, that we don't really think about other than the fragments of this metal and the molten metal and the temperatures and all that kind of stuff, the gases that are put off by the electric burns. Uh, so when you look at um, what you're supposed to be doing on a job site, if it's live, that's really where the issue is here. Going out to a job site, working on a piece of equipment um, or panel when it's live, is where this stuff has the potential uh, to go south. So in order for you to know exactly what the National Electric Code wants you to be wearing, your personal uh, protective equipment is covered in NFPA 70E, which is the electrician's uh, safety manual. And it will tell you the difference between what they consider to be uh, routine maintenance uh, and repair and they're also going to back that up and say look it doesn't matter if you're out there for routine maintenance or checking or doing a repair if that unit is live you're gonna have to have some sort of PPE in order to be in front of it and oftentimes it's gonna be an arc flash uh, hazard suit so if you're a mechanical guy sitting out there with no electrical license uh, and you're thinking to yourself an arc flash hazard suit Oh my goodness, there's no way we're going to wear that. That's why you're taking this class. Okay, that's why this class is so important so that you understand there's more than just going out there and opening up a panel like we've done for my entire career and you may have done for your entire career. There's danger involved and that danger needs to be handled uh, by somebody who understands how to properly mitigate that or to make it as safe as humanly possible. And that arc flash suit uh, is no joke. They're hard to wear, they're expensive to buy, they're expensive to maintain, and in addition to that, they require practice. So when you look at um, 
all of the different uh, aspects of electricity and how they could go south in the mechanical job site. And you're trying to put together a safety program for the year. One thing I'd like to let you uh, in on is, is what some of the other companies are doing uh, currently, and, and I would recommend that you do this as well. If you're in a position, meaning your company, uh, to have to occasionally or maybe even regularly wear arc flash hazard suits, what I would like you to think about is while wearing those arc flash hazard suits, have you ever just tried to do routine checks? Because it's not easy. So as part of those safety classes or safety programs that you're trying to put together for your internal employees, have them do something simple such as put on your arc flash gloves and take measurements on things that are controlled right there in your shop. Have them practice change in their meter settings and all that kind of stuff. Have them look through the arc flash hazard helmet uh, to work with this stuff because it's not easy and you certainly don't want the first time that you've ever done it to be on a job site where your life is at danger uh, because it's, it, it's very difficult. Some of the precautions, well when you look at some of the precautions, most tools and pieces of electrical equipment, especially if they've been um, approved by UL lab, uh, you know, underwriters laboratory, um, they're provided with protective insulation, barriers, and safety devices. They can't protect against unsafe, careless, and take a chance kind of kind of guys that are out there on the on the job site. And the protection that that tool provides is only up to a certain point. You get into the elevated amounts of amperage that you're working on or elevated voltages, you start to get into that uh, category that needs special tools to work on it. Uh, so you want to make sure that your tools are appropriate for the given job site or that you are able to have access to those types of tools. Common sense is going to dictate that you should never touch bare electrical wires or connections. Uh, that should be common sense. But if possible, the other thing you should be thinking about is don't work on hot equipment if you don't have to. Don't do it just because it's easier than going down and shutting off the switch. You know, I, I understand that there's instances when you have to work on uh, hot equipment or live electrical equipment. You know, you go in some of these larger industrial plants or manufacturing plants, and they're going to have uh, million dollar processes that if you shut them down, they're losing thousands or tens of thousands of dollars every minute that that thing is down. And so they want somebody who's going to work on it hot. I understand that. That's probably going to be electricians, not mechanical guys. But if you go down and shut this thing off, make sure you're, you're following lockout tag out procedures, which we'll talk about here in just a little bit. Uh, keep yourself dry. Don't be working on this stuff out on a rooftop or the side of a building uh, when it's damp or wet. Don't lean on the walls when it's damp or wet. Notice when your body is starting to perspire. Now that seems pretty ridiculous, right? And it seems obvious. If it was that obvious, I wouldn't bring it up. If it was that obvious, we wouldn't have people that are getting injured or killed every year that are statistics on OSHA.gov. Um, and so that's why it's important to bring us back to the basics and uh, really remember this stuff. When it comes to electrical safety rules, there's only a couple of them. Don't be a conductor. Should be number one. You know, don't bridge that gap between two electrical connections in which you now become part of that electrical circuit. Stay dry. Avoid working on electrical equipment when you're wet or if your shoes are wet. Don't stand in any kind of puddles or wet ground if possible. Wear rubber-soled shoes. Don't wear any jewelry, watches, rings, metal jewelry, things like that. Uh, they can catch in the machinery and all by itself that can be a hazard. But they also uh, could conduct electricity. And if they're conducting electricity, for instance, like a watch, now you not only have a shock and an entrance point, you've got an entire band around your wrist that now could become electrified and amplify 
all the effects of that electricity. So don't wear any jewelry when you're out there. When you're working on ladders, make sure you use an appropriate ladder. Don't use a ladder that's made of metal pipe or any kind of metal. Use something that's wood or fiberglass that's suitable uh, for potential uh, work around electricity. One hand in the equipment at all time. Okay, the electric path won't go through your heart if you only got one hand in there. You know, and you're wearing rubber sole shoes and you're not standing in water, things like that. It's not a foolproof plan. So I'm not saying it'll never happen. But the, the whole idea here is not to prevent every single person from committing an error. You know, things go sideways all the time. You can't control how the equipment's going to react. The purpose of this program is to minimize damage to the human body or, again, uh, the building. So if you're only using one hand in the equipment at a time, you're minimizing your chance for that electrical circuit to be uh, going from one arm to the other arm through your heart uh, and potentially kill you. Be able to identify those electric hazards. Uh, avoid being that path of least resistance uh, so you become any path. Don't expose your body to two different voltage potentials. Uh, that can be just as bad as touching a grounded object with your hand on an open wire. If you've got two different voltage potentials, they're going to uh, try to equalize. And if you're the object that they can travel through, you're also going to be the object that they're going to equalize through. When you're talking about circuit protection, fuses and circuit breakers uh, by far are the most common forms of circuit protection we've got. So what's the function of fuses and circuit breakers? Well, obviously to protect the wiring connected to the equipment, that's one purpose for them. Second, uh, protect the equipment loads. And the last thing, protect health and life. We know that. Uh, so when you recognize uh, the fact that a 25 milliamp uh, circuit in your hand could be fatal, then you realize that even circuits with half an amp protection uh, could also be lethal. Never mind 15 to 20 amp protected circuits. So where would you find a smaller amperage uh, type circuit? Well, smaller breakers. Smaller, uh, uh, and when I'm talking breakers, I'm actually talking uh, pop-outs. Uh, the smaller fuses is another one uh, where you could run into uh, circuits that have smaller amounts of amperage, maybe on a circuit board, uh, those things can can also be lethal. Doesn't mean they always are, but the idea again minimize the potential that you're exposing yourself to. When it comes to overhead wires, make sure you've got a safe distance. Uh, oftentimes, if we're going into a facility, we have ladders on top of our vans. And when we've got ladders on top of our van, sometimes our ladder racks stick up farther than the ladders themselves. You've got to know where that is. Don't be um, bridging the gap uh, between the ground and that overhead wire with your vehicle. Uh, anytime that you're out there on a job site that's using cranes uh, that have booms or cables, make sure that you're standing very clear of those facilities. We see that all the time when we've got condensing units being uh, boomed up onto a, a rooftop. Uh, there's always a potential to be involved in, in a crane accident when it comes to electricity and and uh, you know if you're interested in some of those videos there's quite a few of those on YouTube as well. Um, make sure that anytime that you're dealing with overhead wires you also understand that standard PPE uh, that you would be wearing personal protective equipment uh, may not be sufficient in any way, shape, or form to the type of power you're going to submit yourself to with an overhead uh, wire. Uh, one thing that, that a lot of us have been uh, conscious of through the years, but we've also been guilty of through the years, is being up on a rooftop in which we've got high voltage cables uh, up on the roof, and instead of going around which is way down by the edge of the roof, we step over them. Be very careful. Exposed wiring. Anytime that you've got exposed wiring, 
loose connect, uh, connections, loose terminals, uh, poorer insulation, that always can create an issue. That's no surprise at all. So anytime that you've got those types of scenarios, correct them. Uh, correct them where appropriate, I should say. Uh, in speaking with mechanical guys, uh, your correction is going to be limited. Oftentimes, in order to correct those issues, we've got to have an electrician on site to do that. Uh, so make sure that you know your place. Not, not all of us should be working on everything. If we're not licensed to do it, uh, then we're not going to, uh, to be licensed uh, you know, to do it just one time. It's all the time or nothing. And if you don't have a proper electrical license, most often time, especially for us mechanical guys, uh, you're limited to everything, whether it's re replacing a wire, uh, some places you can't pull two wire or even thermostat wire without a, a full-on electrical license. Uh, some places you can replace a circuit breaker, but that's all you can do in a panel. You can't ground anything, you can't terminate your bond, any of that kind of stuff. So know what the requirements are in your area. Don't overload circuits. Boy, isn't this a hazard. We see this all the time, but even at our houses, guys. Uh, too many devices on a single circuit. It generates a ton of heat, and heat obviously relates to fire. The sheathing will get dry, cracked, or maybe even melted. Then we expose the wire, and once we expose that wire, um, it's not too long before we create even more of a hazardous uh, potential in which somebody could get electrocuted uh, or a building could start fire. Make sure that the circuit is properly sized uh, to prevent any kind of damage. And then also, um, from a mechanical standpoint, these circuits are not as easy for us to deal with as what they used to be. You can't just uh, take out a two-pronged circuit and put in a three-pronged circuit like we used to. Now we got to take into consideration uh, they have to be grounded. Uh, we've got to have GFCI protection. We have to have arc fall protection. Um, and, and granted, from one municipality to the other, they may change what those requirements are a little bit. But if you look at the broad scope of things, those are reasons that us mechanical guys are not allowed to work on a lot of the electrical stuff because there are a lot of intricacies in the electrical code that we just don't work on enough to understand what the code says and so we're not licensed uh, and, and we really shouldn't be working on that. Uh, you know, anytime we've got a circuit that's overloaded, meltdown is imminent. Uh, we see that quite a bit in the cube farms, um, office buildings where they've got lots of call centers and cubicles is what I've calling cube farms. Uh, you'll see in the winter time, uh, they obviously can't, uh, can't heat or cool that place uh, to accommodate a thousand people. So oftentimes in the winter time, that's usually when you see people trying to do uh, things to keep themselves warmer than the guy next to them or whatever. Uh, so you'll see underneath uh, the cubicle, they'll have a little space heater. Oftentimes that space heater is going to have a long five foot cord or whatever, six foot cord, and they don't have that much room under there. Don't want wires everywhere, so they're going to they're going to wrap that thing up, maybe put a twist tie or a Velcro strap around it or something like that. Well. Uh, we're creating a right potential where where we could have a meltdown. We could create an overamping situation there, in which the sheathing could melt. We could have an arc or a spark, and boom! Now we've got a fire. Some of the examples we run into, in addition to um, having the the under desk uh, heaters, if you will, would be holiday lights. Now uh, we see holiday lights out, uh, and we'll have one circuit running several strings of lights and even though you might see one or two things plugged into that circuit how many extra uh, light strands are plugged in consecutively one after another after another after another uh, it creates a tremendous load on that circuit uh, and could definitely uh, create a, a situation in which we've got a, um, a right potential for, for fire Make sure that you're up to scuff with uh, local codes for your limits that you're allowed on, on your house for, for Christmas lights uh, or inside of a commercial building. Uh, some places restrict being able to put on uh, those GFCI protected uh, outlets. Some of them will only restrict it if the GFCI protection is not there. So know what your local code uh, allows for those particular uh, devices. 
Electrical work? Fitting, right? Could be shocking. Make sure you use the proper equipment for the proper load you're working on. You shouldn't be using handheld instruments uh, for anything greater than 600 volts. And guess what? For us mechanical guys, no electrical license, we shouldn't be working on 600 volts anyway. Um, it's awfully hard to turn down work, especially when things are slow. So if you get out there on these industrial buildings where you're running high amounts of voltage, which in turn run higher amounts of amperage, please, I implore you, know your place. Uh, kindly defer the, the electrical portion of that over to an electrician and come back and diagnose the mechanical side of things or the ventilation side of things. Make sure that your capacitors are properly discharged. Uh, the days of throwing a, a, a screwdriver across the prongs on a capacitor should be long since gone. We've heard the horror stories of them, of them popping or blowing up. Uh, they do have bleed off devices for those. So make sure that you're utilizing those so that an accident doesn't occur. They can hold a charge for quite some time uh, after being disconnected. Uh, Power off any adjacent circuits. Uh, why would it, why would that even matter if you're powering off uh, you know circuits that are nearby? Well, there's something called induction. Uh, so if you've got power wires that are running next to each other, uh, but even though they're not connected, uh, you've got a magnetic field that runs around them. We know that there's a magnetic field there because we use those little uh, pen lights to detect whether there's there's voltage present. The pen light, when you think about it, uh, you take the little uh, uh, meter, the little pocket meter out of your, your pocket, and you put it next to a wire, and it lights up at the end, maybe even makes a beep beep noise. What's actually happening is inside of that, uh, that little pen light, you've got a circuit powered by a battery. But at the very end, you have contacts. Once you get that pen light inside the magnetic field for the wire, it closes that contact. And when it closes the contact, the battery energizes the light and the beeper and, and you know there's power there. And some of them are smart enough to know different ranges of power. So they give you different beeps and, and uh, you know, different sounds uh, and lights based on what power you're talking about. So make sure uh, that the adjacent circuits are, are shut off because that magnetic field can also do what's called inducing power inducing voltage onto the other wires even though they're not powered up at all so we've seen that for years with cable wires people run um, regular power wires with their cable wires across a ceiling or through an attic they strap them together to make it look nice well in reality even though the cable wire doesn't have power on it um, it, it gets power onto it and it ends up messing up the TV or the cable box because of that induced uh, voltage that is on that, that power line. So make sure you're taking care of yourself by uh, shutting off any adjacent circuits. Properly disable power uh, before you're working on this stuff. And by properly disabling it, do it yourself. Never send a customer down to shut off a breaker uh, or a blade or knife switch or anything like that. Uh, always do it yourself and use your lockout, tagout lock uh, that's properly tagged uh, and filled out uh, so that you can be the only one that's going to remove that and you know exactly what's turned off. When it comes to grounding, you want to make sure that grounding protection's uh, installed. All electric systems and, and equipment got to have some kind of grounding protection to help prevent the unintentional energizing of any metal components within the system, including the boxes, the switches, the motors, uh, the conduit, uh, possibly even uh, uh, metal pipe that's adjacent to it, like, like copper. The grounding system should be at zero. Allowing the current a safe path of least resistance in any case is what you want to do to ensure uh, that if the system becomes energized, it's going to trip that breaker. Now, there's a difference between a grounding path and an effective grounding path uh, and 
if you don't know the difference between those two, that's why you should defer to an electrician uh, in, in dealing with some of this stuff. The effective ground path is one you put in there on purpose that uh, is there as a preventative me uh, measure in case uh, the metal parts do become energized we want to make sure they're connected all the way back to the breaker panel so that way the breaker trips. If we have a break anywhere in there, there's a possibility, and I know as mechanical guys you've felt this before, that the conduit or the box could become energized and never trip a circuit. It just sits there and, 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 and it's powered up and it generates heat, which could lead to a fire, but oftentimes it leads to shock and it's to one of us. Uh, we've felt that before. All metal objects have that shock potential. Uh, proper grounding is going to uh, prevent that shock potential. And when it comes to bonding pr uh, principles, uh, I'm going to defer that to NFPA 54 sections 713.2 when dealing with CSST. It's very important that you remember that. NFPA 54 section thir uh, 7 13 2 in which it says uh, CSST corrugated stainless steel tubing gas tight track pipe diamond pipe uh, things like that uh, any length of CSST has to be bonded beginning with the first downstream fitting from the source to the first fitting on the length of CSST it doesn't get any easier than that in my own mind, but there are lots of different interpretations of what they're actually talking about there. Be aware of what your code official actually wants as far as the bonding goes. That's hugely important. Bonding simply connects metal objects that could potentially carry current and it gets real when you connect them it gets rid of the potential difference between there and if there's no potential difference there's no reason for it to arc or spark. So that's why you're bonding. It's important to realize that it is code and it is enforced in most areas. However, uh, code officials will enforce this in a little bit different way uh, in different areas. So make sure you understand what they want. And in most areas, uh, guess what? Mechanical guys can't do it. Not, not physically can't do it, but uh, by, by licensing reasons, they can't do it because they can't terminate that bonding uh, wire uh, properly because it's, it's going to be inside of that panel. Check the ground prong. Uh, understanding uh, that the grounding prong has got to be present. Um, you're talking a three prong cord here uh, when it comes to the grounding prong. Don't cut that thing off. With no grounding prong, there's nothing to trip that breaker. There's nothing as a life safety measure for you or the homeowner or the building worker. So cutting that cord again against code and really against moral beliefs. Yeah, it makes it easier to plug into two prong receptacles, uh, but they do make adapters for that. Don't cut that prong off, uh, especially uh, anytime that you're out on a, on a job site that's not your, not your house. Uh, we can't control what you do in your house, but I would say, even in your own house, do not cut that ground plug, uh, plug off to make it easier for yourself. That's a safety, uh, safety measure. When it comes to wet conditions, work as little as possible in wet conditions. Anytime you're in wet conditions, the risk of shock goes up ext extremely high. Um, and anytime you're installing things in wet locations, uh, one of the things you got to think about is, is it in a location that requires waterproof wires and connectors uh, and also wet proof tools? Uh, so those things are always something that you got to take into consideration. Anytime we're talking about wet conditions, ground fault circuit interrupters come into play. Uh, ground fault circuit interrupters have been uh, code requirement for a very long time now uh, and they have taken over areas inside of a home. You're now going to see the GFCIs installed in uh, bathrooms and unfinished areas of the basement, uh, garages, your front, outside your front door, outside your back door. So they're all over the place 
And uh, the one thing to keep in mind with GFCI is the, the way they work is, is very interesting. There's a reason they want them in, in wet locations. It doesn't just tr trip on a short. Okay, that's not what we're looking at here. It trips based on the amount of amperage going out and the amount of amperage coming back. You could picture it as a hot and a neutral wire. If the amount of amperage going out and coming back is different, and the difference equals 3 to 5 milliamps at least, uh, then the GFCI is going to trip. Now, if I become that circuit and I hold on to the hot leg and the neutral leg, and the circuit just goes straight through me and, and uh, on back to the source, I may not change uh, the incoming and ex exiting uh, amp draw, so it won't trip. And, and that's why it can't be the primary life-saving device. It, it is a life-saving device when you're talking about where it's located and how it's supposed to act and things like that secondarily. But when you look at these things, they're, they're very interesting, and that's why you're going to see them all over in a house. And that's, and that's a requirement by code. It's easily said now that any place that's not GFCI protected in a home is going to be arc fault protected. We talked about lockout tagout programs uh, a couple of times, and it's important to bring it back up just to uh, close out the rest of this class. Uh, lockout tagout programs are mandatory for everybody. You have to have a way to shut off the breaker, the panel, uh, what have you, with a proper lockout tagout device that has tags on there that tells uh, who the actual person is that's locking it out, the date that it was locked out, uh, things of that nature. You gotta, you gotta do this because you want to make sure somebody else isn't going to come along and say, "Oh, it's hot in that office. This must be why it's hot. Uh, this breaker's off," and turn it back on. Well, if there's a lockout tag on there, that is pretty universally accepted that uh, it, it's something that somebody should leave alone and not mess with, uh, or even try to mess with. When it comes to lockout tagout programs, um, they those programs require uh, periodic safety training. Uh, they've got detailed procedures they want you to follow that aren't going to be addressed here in this program, but they are worth looking into uh, so that everybody in your company is on uh, the same page. You know, some of those things uh, that you could be looking at is what, what type of lockout tagout uh, device would I need to have you know, based on the type of work that I perform. Uh, what type of information needs to be on the tag? Um, will we have the ability to pass these tags off from one person to the next? Well, each individual is supposed to have only keys for their lockout tagouts, but you have to have provisions. If the end of the shift comes and the work's not done and somebody else is going to take over, there has to be a provision uh, to allow you to pass the torch, if you will, from yourself on to the next person that will need to fire that unit back up once the uh, the work has been uh, performed and done.